Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Data Diversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Data Diversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing 2024 trends in enterprise analytics. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A section. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to know the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To find and open both the Q&A and the chat sections, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best-known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and a popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. William is a leading global influencer in data warehousing and master data management, and he leads McKnight Consulting Group, which has twice placed on the incorporated 5,000 list. And with that, I'll give the floor to William to get today's webinar are started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Thank you very much. Let me get my slide going here. All right. And Shannon, congratulations to you for 900 webinars now produced. Ah, that thank is, you. <laughs> yes, that's a great accomplishment. And um, you are the goat of webinar production, that's for sure. And I'm going to try to be timing it so that my webinar is going to be number 1,000. That'll be down the Love road. It. Now, for the rest <laughs> of us, <laughs> I have 23 trends for you as we end 23. I always enjoy end of the year thinking back over the prior year and thinking over what has really changed in the past year. Because sometimes as we go through our day-to-day it's hard to see the bigger picture of what is happening around us and what we need to be thinking about as we go into the, the new year. Um, but I'm gonna be helping you with that. I'm going to be picking on trends here to share with you that I think are going to stick. I'm not sharing the trends that I don't think you need to really care about. I'm not trend chasing and I don't, I don't want you to be doing that either. So. Let's, uh, let's zero in on these things, see if you agree. I'm certainly not a soothsayer here, but see if you agree with the direction that I'm suggesting things are going in. And if you do, I think it behooves you and all of us to uh, bring those ideas into our organization, start trying to fit them in. But first, a little look at our partial client list. Uh, to let you know kind of where these trends are coming from uh, and what where we are picking up uh, where things are going from. A lot of big companies in here, a lot of industries, and proud to serve all of them over the course of, I think I'm now over 25 years in consulting. And this is the technology set for our company, uh, always growing and uh, and changing, and I'm, as I'm sure it is for your companies as well. But if you need any help with any of these, uh, let us know for sure. Now, I mentioned a little bit about why trends are important. Um, it is imperative to see these trends and they're going to affect your business and you need to know how to respond to that, plan for and deal with that change. And I say it's better to be at the beginning of the trend rather than at the end of the trend. You don't have to be a type A company that's hopping on everything and and some will some you'll throw away. You can be a fast follower. I think that's a good strategy. And that's kind of where I'm I'm guiding us today. So you won't see any Hadoop in here. You won't see any Six Sigma OS2. I'm probably dating myself with that one. Um, how about NFTs? Uh, although I think they may come back around in some way, shape, or form, but they certainly have sunk over the course of the year. I would not call that one of the trends that uh, I want us to follow, but as you do follow great trends that make sense for your business, you will gain efficiency and you will gain capabilities uh, within your organization. Also keep in mind that your customer base are seeing these trends at, as well, and they are preparing for these trends and they are looking to you to see how you are preparing for those trends. And this makes you a leader, not a follower. It's also gonna be a lot of good business ideas in here today for you, I think, as well. Of course, you'll have to adopt them 
adapt them to your company situation. Uh, I try to grow leaders. I try to help leaders. And I think that uh, there are three characteristics of information management leaders who follow good trends and do something about them. Informa information management leaders of tomorrow can advance maturity while also solving business issues. Clearly, these trends are going to be part of maturing your enterprise, maturing your data uh, within the enterprise. And you do not really get budget. I, I'll say I've never got budget for growing maturity. Here's some money to grow our maturity. It's more about delivering business wins. And while in the course of doing that, you also grow the maturity. You also get these trends on board within your company. You always have to be looking for how you're going to architect the next thing. And it cannot just be, well, we've always done it this way. So let's do it that way. It, things are changing so rapidly. And there's no budget for staying on trends. I mentioned that. Information man, man, management leaders must pick their winning, i.e. multi-year sustainable approaches and get on board uh, at the right time. Now, when you're ahead of the game and you're anticipating these trends and you're looking for the opportunity, you are way ahead because then when the opportunity presents itself, you can incorporate the trend and then you can start to uh, optimize around that trend within your business. But if it hits you like a ton of bricks because the customer is picking on you because you did not uh, adopt a trend or you're way behind your competition and you got to catch up, that's a worse situation. So these trends will hopefully help you get ahead of the game and become the leader that we all want to be, right? So first, let's take a look back at last year's trends. At this presentation from 360 whatever days ago that I presented, uh, I presented probably, I think it was about 20 trends last year, and most of them hit. I'll give myself an A minus, and you can decide for yourself whether you think you need to stay on for the rest of the presentation to see nobody's talking about or not. But last year, I talked about these that hit data democracy, data democratization and the CDO culture focus. CDOs have been champions of empowering data users and building data-driven cultures. Glad to see it. Augmented working, yeah. AI and automation are now seamlessly integrating into workflows, creating augmented intelligence workplaces. And as we all, I think, saw over the course of 2023, a big part of 2023 was this was augmented working and all these tools that these major providers are are adding now for uh, their engine for engineering efforts for all of us. The data fabric I picked on that last year, connecting diverse data sources through a unified fabric. It's become a major theme in data management. I get asked a lot about it. We implement it. Uh, we think that it definitely has legs, as does another of the decentralized architectures, the data mesh, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. How about multi-model databases? Hybrid environments and diverse data types are fueling the rise of these flexible multimodal databases, which means that we are not just using a database for a data type. And that's it. That creates 20 databases that we have to, to manage. Now, a lot of them have the capabilities, especially the NoSQL family of databases, all right? They have the capability to, to store quite a few different data types. Now, we're seeing this raise again here in terms of vector databases, vector search, right? A lot of the major vendors have this capability now, yet at the same time, there are emerging startups that are solely focused on that. Uh, the data fabric. Yes, the data was, was that on here? No, we got cloud native technologies. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around. Cloud native technologies and containerized applications. Yes, that was huge. That was huge. almost everything that I see developed is being developed in a containerized fashion. Low code, no code data apps with citizen developers, so-called citizen developers, right? Low-code, no-code tools, democratize data app development. And if anything, 
the direction is towards more of this, more of a decentralized approach inside of enterprises. It's a slow process to decentralize what has been centralized in the past, say in the in the 2020s, in the early 2020s versus now, but it is definitely happening. Serverless computing. Uh, maybe I give myself an A minus on that one because yes, everybody has a serverless computing option now, but at the same time, it's not necessarily uh, doing big things. It's not necessarily where you're putting your mission critical applications due to the cost and other factors, but it's there. Comprehensive data protection, data privacy and security. Yeah, it, says it, it grew. It grew in importance over the course of the year. It's it's a top agenda item for any new application and something that we're re-engineering a lot of applications to be more compliant with today. So there's definitely a lot of room to grow in, in that area as well. As a matter of fact, let me just say that a lot of these trends are also trends for this year. Now, did I include them all in my presentation today? No, because there's so many new trends that I got to get to as well. But these are trends that you can also take to the bank and say, I got to do something about these as well. Neural nets and machine learning for text. Well, yeah, that was huge, right? Uh, Gen AI, LLMs were totally all over everything. And uh, there was a lot of planning done. And this year, there's going to be a lot of doing done. And I'll get to that. Synthetic data used for training AI models. Yes, the ethical and practical advantages of synthetic data for AI training gained recognition, leading to increased adoption and research in this area. And just AI infusion generally in everything. So I'm going to have a bunch of trends for you around AI. Can't help it. That's where a lot of things are going. Now, there were trends also that did not get. Data governance and regulation. I said, well, we're going to have some more of that. Well, we probably did have a little more, but... Um, I didn't I didn't get a sense of there being a ton. Now, what I'm talking about here is having more of the world's population covered by regulation similar to the GDPR, right? Data governance will continue to be an important task for businesses over the next 12 months. I think there's going to be more regulation and I'll, I'll get to that. But in 2023, didn't didn't uh, didn't affect a lot of the applications that we were working on. Consumers will be more willing, to trust organizations with their data if they are sure it's well looked after. And that does come back to data governance. So I'm not, I'm not saying don't do data governance. I'm saying that it didn't, we didn't do enough of it. How about that? Uh, that we need to we need to continue to focus there and it will only make our applications better. Real-time data, still it feels like it's right-time data and not everything necessarily needed to go to real time, despite what. I might assert for my projects, or you might assert for your projects. It's more of an as needed thing. And I'm starting to realize that that's probably practical and probably where things will be. There'll be plenty of real time need. As a matter of fact, when it comes to big data and high volumes of streaming data, you pretty much have to take care of that in real time, whether you're going to be needing it, quote unquote, in real time because of the volume. You don't want to get behind data observability. Well, this is interesting. A lot of you might be thinking, well, didn't I hear a lot about it? You heard a lot about it. Um, and I heard a lot about it, uh, certainly from vendors, but uh, I didn't see a lot of it now. This is, this is going to change. This is going to change soon. As I look at budgets, this is going to change. This emerging concept has potential and wider awareness and adoption are needed. And uh, that's only going to be true as things get more complex and we get more into data science, which we will. And finally, uh, I went very niche here with this trend. I said object tagging attribute-based access control would be the means of doing uh, access control. And I just say on that one that it's probably still maturing. So with that out of the way, uh, let's look at the trends this year and information management first. First category, information management. Companies will seek a safe harbor, as I'm putting it, in a simplified data architecture. Just call me Mr. Simplification. Call yourselves 
Mr. and Mrs. Simplification out there. Let's simplify these architectures so that we can become more efficient. We can become more adaptive to what's going on around us. Now, to me, architecture is simplified not when it meets some book definition of you got your sources, they go into a staging area, it goes into the warehouse. We all know what that looks like, the data lake, the data science there, the BI here, and so on. But when you can when you can explain it for your company and it's fairly consistently adhered to, it's one thing to talk about your architecture when it's not exactly what's being done. Um, it's more or less a wish list, and that's okay too to have it, but uh, I, I'd rather see it implemented, right? And again, the word is simplification. And this is the word that my clients are screaming to me, simplify our architecture. We wanna get ready for AI, but it's hard to do when data is all over the place and we don't know where it is and we bring new people in and it takes some months and months to get up to speed. So you want that architecture to be explainable, and certainly we're doing we're doing a lot of work in that area and we hear a lot about that. Now, that being said, there's no one size fits all yet. That would really simplify things, right? In terms of platform. But uh, if anything, the data lake holds a lot of promise there, but it's still not gonna be one size fits all for quite a while. So let's get used to it and keep architecture in focus, keep simplification in focus. Speaking of simplification, this is also true for data security and governance purposes. And as I see it, I believe the data mesh concept is going to take place because, or take, take more place because of data security and governance concerns. It will become a significant trend in 2024. IT will play a big role in this, they have to. But this whole idea of decentralizing, it's only reality. It's only really accepting the reality of the situation. And again, I mentioned before, decentralization is hard to, to pull away from once you're fully there, as a lot of us got to, right? Um, organizations must enhance the end user experience. And this is a way to do it, to have multiple data lakes, multiple data warehouses, multiple data integration environments, probably multiple data science platforms. But when I say multiple, I don't mean just ad hoc and uh, random, what, what seems like random, but something that again is done in an architected fashion. So you, you are not helping the data security cause of your organization by doing a data mesh in an unarchitected fashion, or by, or by, I should say, doing something and calling it a data mesh. Data mesh is not a data mess. It's a data mesh. There's an architecture, there's a science to it. And these things do fit together. And again, I'll get back to, let's keep it simple. All right. Unstructured data, almost at parity with structured data. You know, all those years in our past, we talked about, yeah, well, there's more unstructured data than structured data, but it's not as important. And we're focused over here on structured data. And that's okay. And it was okay for a while. It was competitive to do that for quite a while. But now we see that decentralized architectures support all data. We can actually store a lot more data than we used to. And we have, but we still have to mix and match uh, data between data warehouses and data lakes and whatever else that you may call these things or have in your organization, whatever other hubs, et cetera. So data warehouses are best for data modeling, structured data and reporting, and data lakes have price performance advantages for big data, best for data engineering and science, and colder data that we may or may not ever access, and certainly not in a hot uh, fashion where it's business critical of the moment kind of thing. With data formats like Apache Iceberg, Delta, and Apache Hootie, the data lakes are starting to resemble data warehouses. So are we building more warehouses or lakes now? We're building more lakes. We're building more lakes. And we're getting more of those warehouse capabilities inside our lakes. I would still say we need those warehouses. But all of this comes under the umbrella of unstructured data. It's almost at parity with structured data. And certainly, I think 
the more unstructured data that we have to deal with is driving more of a data lake orientation in our environments. Now, this is a fun one. Believe it or not, I know it's about finance and numbers, but it's kind of fun. Data fin ops, the word of the year. If there was a word of the year beyond chat GPT, uh, in, my, in my area, I would call it optimization. I'm sure most of you have heard that word. It's kind of a funny word if you think about it uh, in terms of what it describes uh, in an enterprise. It describes as trying to get your costs under control and moving data to where it's going to be from a storage and compute perspective, least expensive because these expenses are growing. We're needing more data at the same time. Sometimes I think that organizations, uh, maybe the CFO office might look at bottom lines uh, of cost versus the top line possibilities and, and say that something needs to be done here and efforts get underway to move data to the less expensive areas uh, in our architecture. And we call that optimization. And it's gonna to continue to be true in 2024. I'm not saying we're cutting back. I'm saying we're just trying to keep the costs under control, not trying to knock the costs down necessarily. That's not gonna happen. We got more data, we got more uses for it. We've got more uh, duplicate data in our organizations than ever. And as I get back to, as long as we have a simple architecture, we can describe why that is, then it's okay. So for example, we have a client right now, they're getting Salesforce data cloud, compute is cheap there. So uh, what about that? Well, the storage is maybe not so cheap there, but so we have Snowflake, we have a data warehouse, great. Um, storage is cheap there, but compute is expensive. So we have to create a design where the data flows from one to the other, uh, but it does so in a cost-effective manner. And we might even throw data bricks into the equation there to do some of the pre-processing. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing out there in spades uh, in, in the enterprise today. And that's going to continue these kind of uh, twisting yourself into a pretzel to keep the costs down kinds of things that we didn't used to do. We used to just plow through and have our structures and that's what we did. Uh, but now we have to really look at cost as well. So that's a very important dimension to our architecture. Now, data privacy. Data privacy, the, the trend here is that data privacy regulations, if you will, are going to start affecting business operations. I'm talking about GDPR, C CCPA types of things. Like for example, if you look around the world, China, they have their PIPL. Now the emphasis there is on data localization and government oversight while granting individuals some rights. In Brazil, they have the general data protection law, which is similar to GDPR in many aspects, but with a focus on international data transfers and specific protections for children and adolescents. India has their PDPB, which is still under development. Can't say too much about that, but these all have different focuses. The focus might be national security, might be individual rights, might be data misuse. And businesses have generally been quite adept at adapting to new regulations, but I just think they're gonna come on fast and furious in 2024, we might get to points where some businesses will remove their operation from some geographic areas because of what they perceive as undue regulation around data privacy. Just doesn't work for their concept. So a look for that in 2024 might be a very rational decision that your company has to make. Now let's get back to data governance and, and regulation. Um, data governance is going to be augmented with AI governance. And AI might be the thing to drive a lot of governance within organizations because a lot of organizations now are, are struggling with this concept of, okay, there's AI now, we're doing that and it does this. And what about the ethics here? And, and, um, the perception of it and the accuracy of it and all this. 
this all should come back to data governance. Data governance, when you have it in place, it's a great body within the organization that can take up this cause of AI governance. So Gen AI has introduced new concepts, vector search, RAG, and prompt engineering. So modern AI governance must cater to the needs of multiple personas, such as model owners, validators, audit teams, data engineers, data scientists, ML ops engineers, compliance, privacy, and security teams. Yeah, all this goes on within organizations today. It's not uh, totally streamlined yet, although I'll get to a trend about that in a bit. But AI governance needs to be applied to model training and model usage, or inference as we're calling it, where the governance tasks need to ensure safe business usage. These tasks include things like identification of risks and risk mitigation, explainability of models, the cost, and the performance of using AI models to achieve business use goals. Hugging Face, which was a big trend in 2023 as a company, right? Uh, it was nearing uh, half a million models. It, it may be there, maybe there now. Half a million models. How does a company decide which ones are safe, which ones are correct, which ones are ethical? Well, gets back to governance. So AI governance like data governance should work hand in hand, that they should work hand in hand. Models are proliferating rapidly and AI governance tools should help identify the risks, mitigate them and provide explainability. Uh, the thing I can think of that's maybe a starting point uh, in one of our clients is the Databricks Unity Catalog. It already converges the data catalog with the AI models metadata, providing a unified platform for managing and discovering data assets. And this integration allows users to easily search, explore, and understand both structured and unstructured data, as well as to leverage AI models to gain insights and make those data-driven decisions that they need to make. So there is some... Uh, some starting point for that. Now, let's move on to the biggest category and that's artificial intelligence. It's the biggest because that's where we're going to spend a lot of our time in 2024. Now, I might be going out on a limb here and that's okay, I don't mind, but I think there's gonna be a lot of Gen AI, Gen AI and LLM success this year. I'm optimistic about it. I see it already. I see the plants and I know that we're going to keep coming back to this until we get it right. And we're gonna have that success in Gen AI and LLM this year. Huge integration already of this into our daily routines here in the US, right? Email, we see it all, all the time. Email, online search, personal assistance like Siri and so forth. We're seeing the integration into daily routines. And whenever you see that, you know that it's, uh, it's something that we're going to pursue till we get it right. It's already proven itself quite a bit. As these LLMs become more democratized, we'll see most organizations start with smaller language models. That's gonna become more the industry standard. So LLMs and SLMs, I guess, smaller language models, these are all going to be uh, providing that kind of uh, value within the organization. There will be some huge players, but in general, most suppliers will fine tune smaller models targeted towards specific sectors and use cases. So I can see a future with millions of these smaller language models operating at the company or the departmental level and providing hyper-customized insights based on the employee or the need. Other trends in this general area that I'll mention now, the hallucination problem. Yes, that's when the Gen AI is wrong. Uh, I think that will largely be solved. Largely solved. And the emergence of multimodal, multimodal LLMs, where you have audio, video, and picture integration, as well as text, that's going to happen in 2024. Technology-wise, I will mention Langchain as a, a, a conduit for all of this success that I am suggesting. Langchain allows users to feed the results of one LLM into another 
LLM. And that just gets you uh, exponential benefit around whatever it is that you're doing with that data. So in the projects that I see, I would say about a third of them in varying sizes have a meaningful Gen AI component to them. These are projects going into 2024, about a third. Most of the projects are small pilots to begin with, and the Gen AI components may constitute only, say, 10, 15% of the total revenue that's hoped for out of the project. But further, many of these projects are being funded now by leaders, uh, vendor leaders like Microsoft and Databricks, because they want to get in on the ground floor and they want to have those early successes. Gen AI powered chatbots, understanding of documents, and document search form the bulk of these use cases. Now, one more thing, kind of a caveat to all the success, and maybe in your on your mind now, is about that uh, lawsuit that was filed. Did you see that? The lawsuit filed by the New York Times against Microsoft and OpenAI? Mm-hmm. That's pretty important. And I believe that there may be a U.S. court this year that may rule that Gen AI models trained on the internet represent some form of a violation of copyright. However, I believe that a middle ground will be achieved that will not paralyze the Gen AI industry. So that could go a different direction and that could turn the success on its head. But I believe that we'll find a way to allow this industry basically to continue. Also, AI hardware advancements in 2024. Yes, I know we like our R3 larges. I like our, I like our R3 larges, but uh, and that's an AWS model. But uh, there's going to be there's going to be some more. I think there's a lot of companies out there that have seen that we're doing a lot of of change in 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 this in this in our area of uh, technology within enterprises. A lot of change being born of AI and being born of the need for large amounts of data and large amounts of data science. So we are seeing specialized AI accelerators being built. These are more affordable and accessible hardware solutions that could bring AI within the reach of smaller companies and developers, fostering a wider innovation. We're seeing more edge computing so that at the edge, we can have the benefit of real-time AI in very diverse environments. And we're seeing some open source hardware initiatives, which are collaborative efforts to develop and share hardware designs that could accelerate in innovation and reduce barriers to entry. So look for changes in AI hardware. I'm not saying that it's going to replace a lot of our AWS, Azure, GCP, OCI, you know, cloud that we're doing in 2024, but it's going to start coming on the scene. And I expect this could be a major trend in 2025 where we actually do move some of our workloads to brand new AI-based hardware. Focus on efficiency in machine learning modeling. Yes, uh, these pre-trained models like AutoML and SageMaker, they can be expensive. And they can sometimes not provide high quality accurate models. So more accuracy in models could happen. There is an overfitting problem and there is a long tail problem where uh, rare questions are, are very difficult. Uh, the standard questions are easy, but the rare questions are difficult sometimes for uh, Gen AI today. And I think that is something that will largely abate in 2024 as we get more efficient in our machine learning models. We will develop new neural network architectures that achieve high accuracy with fewer parameters, reducing training time and resource consumption. And a lot of this is why I have a lot of that, which is that Gen AI success that's coming. Okay, now I mentioned some regulation uh, that's coming, but ESG and AI ethics, I don't see any progress being made there. I'm not happy about this one. And I think uh, strict tech technology regulation is quite challenging. Take a look at section 230 
of the 1996 U.S. Communications Decency Act, which shields websites from liability for content posted by third parties. It made the internet possible as we know it, but it also made hate speech, misinformation, and bullying uh, possible on the internet. And sometimes we've learned that regulations with good intentions can occasionally backfire. So right now, in terms of ESG and AI ethics, it's going to be an ongoing dialogue. I'm not sure we're going to do enough, in my view, anyway, uh, about it. There is There was some discussion at the presidential level, right? We saw that a few months ago, mid-September, when executives from OpenAI, NVIDIA, Google, Meta, it was a it was a private round table. We can only have educated guesses about what was discussed. And uh, I'm, I'm guessing it was a good introductory talk, um, but I don't see anything yet uh, coming in this area. I do think that companies themselves are taking up the helm of AI ethics, but they're groping around in the dark now without a lot of good direction for that. Still doing it, and that's a good thing. Now, speaking of machine learning, we're moving to machine learning ops. This is the idea of taking all the goodness of DevOps and applying it to machine learning, which has some unique uh, things about it. So many companies have built strong machine learning capabilities, but they haven't built a good, let's say, path to production for those capabilities. And that's what machine learning ops, to me anyway, is all about. Uh, putting majority of your ML models into production and getting all of that value out of the machine learning models. The three main objectives I show there are to create a highly repeatable procedure where data scientists and analysts are shielded from complexity. They are not shielded from complexity now. They are very much involved in the complexity of our data architectures. And truth be told, uh, most data scientists spend most of their time wrangling data not doing the modeling that they uh, they should and 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 can be doing. Develop ML ML ops, excuse me, so that it scales without a horde of engineers, along with the number of models and modeling complexity. So repeatable process where scientists and analysts are shielded, and it scales. Those are some of the goals of ML ops, and I think we're going to be adopting that left and right in 2024. So make sure you're developing your capabilities there. Now, AI agents. These are personalized assistants for data exploration. These are smart data environments which provide fertile ground for AI agents to blossom, offering them structured, secure, and readily accessible data to learn and act upon. This is what I've been, I've been talking about for years, but I haven't had good words for it, nor have I established any good words for it. But the industry has done that now kind of for me here. AI agents, which are going into data and enhancing the intelligence of the environment by feeding insightful recommendations and automating tasks back into the system. There's really no two ways about it. If you're a data analyst out there in an organization, you're going to need to level up because a lot of those, shall I say, uh, shallow needs of uh, a data analyst uh, and they're not all shallow, don't get me wrong, but those are really largely going to go the way of AI agents in 2024. While challenges will remain in integrating and managing complex data and AI systems, 2024 could be a year where smart data environments and AI agents converge to unlock new levels of data insights and automation, empowering users, enhancing data security, and driving pro proactive decision-making which will make them a force to be reckoned with in the involving landscape of data management and AI. So AI agents, watch that space. AI companions, yeah, there's my companion, my replica, if you will. It's an AI chatbot. Chatbot, it's kind of like your friend. It's kind of like the perfect friendship because she knows everything <laughs> and she knows you. Uh, it's a personalized assistant for support, acting as a virtual concierge or assistant helping to manage and automate tasks. Now we have AI applications that remind seniors when to take medication, about doctor's appointments, and even when to eat. This can help remove the anxiety and confusion that many of them face. So it's about, it's about um, a companionship. It's about uh, uh, helping people 
that uh, may be lonely, et cetera, that kind of thing. But it's really about helping everybody to achieve higher levels of success. So it's a changing social landscape. It's hard to put your finger on the words about what is happening in this changing social landscape where we you have AI entering the picture in places in our lives where people used to be. And I'm not championing this. I'm just saying that that is what's happening and that is a strong trend. Now, I have to throw another caveat in here about that Gen AI success I was talking about. GPU shortage. I think we'll we'll get around it. We'll learn to work with the GPUs that we have, but the generative AI rush is driving GPU demand. And to top it off, restrictions have been placed uh, somewhat on NVIDIA, for example, their exports to China, which is driving down uh, GPU availability even here in the US market. So companies looking to purchase GPUs for on-prem capabilities may find themselves on a wait list. I know I am. Shortage concerns are most accurate, uh, most acute, excuse me, for the vendors training models, including cloud service providers. The cost of GPU compute may also come down as companies learn to balance workloads more efficiently. Getting back to that optimization word, so that word is going to be continue to be important if for no other reason than there is a GPU shortage. And that will continue throughout the year. Uh, when that is uh, fixed, maybe by the end of the year, who knows? But when that gets fixed, you're going to see all of these AI trends take off even more. Now, industries that are going to be affected in 2024 by AI, materially is one of them is healthcare. I'm calling out a couple that I think are going to be tremendously impacted in 2024, mostly in a good way. We are moving from a system of generalized healthcare based on population averages. So when you go to your doctor, you're gonna be treated because you're a human just based on an average. I know that's how I feel sometimes. And we're moving to a world of personalized medicine and the foundation of your personalized healthcare will be your sequence genome and electronic health records. Now, will we have millions of people, their sequence ge genome uh, uh, captured by the end of the year? No, I don't think so. Not, did I say billions? I meant billions. Uh, I don't think so. Well, I think we may be into the millions though uh, in this new year. And that's how they know you. More people have had their whole genome sequence or will in 2024, then we're gonna be able to compare what the genes say to how those genes are expressed. And then humans themselves, we will become a big data set. And this is going to move us to predictive healthcare where you're going to be born, you're gonna have all this information for your parents and they're gonna be able to steer the ship through your genes, whether, you're, whether they want you to be great at math or great at sprinting or what have you. And I also think while I'm here that doctors were going to see a material increase in the trust of the decisions that are made by algorithms. Um, and, and, and we're going to see that generally override some of their opinions where today it's all, all their, their opinions. I, I don't mean opinions like it's anybody's opinion, right? It's a very educated opinion, but the algorithms are going to be making a lot of the decisions as we go forward. Now, the other industry that I see having major advancements in AI in 2024 is education. Now, we can all see the possibilities here. It's a matter of codifying those possibilities and putting it into action. And this is where I see a lot of promise. Companies like Duolingo, which is a personalized learning platform which uses AI to adapt language lessons based on individual progress and learning styles. Intelligent tutoring, like third space learning, which connects students with AI powered virtual tutors. Adaptive assessment like McGraw-Hill Connect, which offers AI powered assessment and feedback tools integrated into digital textbooks. Immersive learning like Google Ex Expeditions, which offers virtual reality field trips 
special education like Lexplore, which uses AI powered eye tracking technology to assess reading difficulties and higher education solutions like Georgia Tech's Jill Watson, an AI powered lead teaching assistant that answers student questions in online courses, providing instant support and reducing faculty workload. So we're seeing a lot of change here happening in education, but I do believe that AI, AI will impact all industries in 2024. These are just a couple that I think are going to get uh, more than others. At the same time, most people out there are unaware of what is going on. Most of humanity is a good 10 years behind the possibilities. They don't believe cars can drive themselves. They don't understand the depth of their vulnerabilities. They don't understand the depth of manipulation science and the vast range of, of humanity. We're not all the same. So they're not going to believe what they see is fake. So here we have a deep fake uh, of uh, an actress. I forget her name, but <laughs> she's at the top there. Uh, we can see on the lady uh, here as well that there are a lot of data points that we can analyze to create those deep fakes. And we see Sophia, maybe you've heard me talk about Sophia, Sophia in the lower right, a robot. Um, she's a citizen of Saudi Arabia. She's famous for saying, I have feelings too. And in a way she does. Now, we also have this um, election coming in the United States this year. And I think deep fakes are going to uh, play a role in that. So keep your, keep your critical skeptical hat on as we go into this uncharted territory called the election. All right, now let's hit the last category, which I just called a broader environment. Some of this does have to do with our day-to-day -day work in IT and technology, and some of it has to do with other things, but let's start with cloud native approaches. I have to talk about this because, wow, such a, such a trend. I know it was a trend for me last year, and I know I wasn't dragging all them forward, but I am dragging this one forward because it's still at that level of being a top 23 trend for us all in 2024. The microservices architecture, right? Applications broken down into smaller, loosely coupled services that can be independently developed, deployed, and scaled. Each microservice typically serves a specific business capability. And most of these are containerized applications uh, applications and their dependencies are packaged into containers, which ensure consistency and portability across different environments. And being multi-cloud is actually still quite important. It's still something that uh, people cite to me regularly as something that's important to them and not getting locked into one cloud. That might change over time, but that's still pretty important right now as well. So all of this uh, taken together is a cloud native approach. Infrastructure as code, where infrastructure is defined and managed programmatically through code, allowing for versioning and repeatability and automated provisioning. Tools like Terraform or cloud formation are used for this. And let's add in observability. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that in, in a few minutes, but I think that's an important part of being cloud native. And many are agreeing with me, I guess, there. And so observability is a trend as well. And I'll get to that in a moment, but let me also talk about the future of vendor software, the future being 2024. I see uh, that enterprise level features like security partitioning and parallelism, better instrumentation, troubleshooting tools, performance and resilience options are added to open source, no, closed source databases. And we are seeing a lot of unbalanced situations. I think the, and let me explain that uh, by saying, for example, AWS has taken many open source databases from the community, right? Aurora reused MySQL and PostgreSQL. Redshift uses PostgreSQL and DynamoDB storage is based on MySQL's InnoDB. They take it, add interesting features, but they don't give back to the community. And the cloud providers notoriously reuse open source in their commercial services. So that's what I mean by unbalanced. And an unbalanced situation will have to rectify itself. Not everything is a 
is a Red Hat success. Vendors will provide a smaller subset of their features for free and enterprise features like backup scalability and encryption come with a commercial license. So I think we're in the midst of what I'll call post open source in which the software matters. Yeah, software matters, but it's licensing where it comes from and all that matters less. The cost matters, the cost matters, but uh, the, the lure, I guess, or the aura of open source will tend to abate a bit in 2024. So if you're in a shop where everything has to be open source, uh, you might want to start reconsidering that this year. Now I'm calling it, calling my shot, Babe Ruth pointing at the right field fence, right? Okay. The year of, of observability, the year of observability. I see a strong uptake in observability platforms. I see lots of budgets going that direction, lots of plans for it because of the need, because of the value that it provides. Consolidation and the complexity of cloud environments are driving growth for observability as companies choose their observability cons cons consolidation, I can say it, vendor. However, cloud optimization efforts are having an impact on observability growth because observability spend will be down in trail cloud spend. But this is going to change in 2024 as observability catches up to cloud implementations. And there is a clear correlation between cloud utilization and observability spend. And I think we should probably get past this notion of, wow, it's a really special thing that we're doing here with optimization. That's not a special thing. That's not a one-off thing. That's not a that shouldn't be a trend. That should be just something that we, we do. We, we optimize our environments to lower costs, to keep costs down. Not at all costs, meaning not at the expense of getting the value out of the project and driving business growth and all the things that are more important, but all things being equal, we should spend less, right? And so uh, I think that that'll kind of work its way into our fabric as technology professionals in 2024 and observability will be a part of that, will be right there. And I think logging is going to be a key initial battleground here for observability vendors. So there's going to be a lot going on in observability in 2024. There's also going to be some hybrid quantum computing. Okay. We are seeing quantum hardware maturing. It's still in early stages, but quantum processes are making processors are making strides in qubit count and coherence time, which makes them more suitable for hybrid integration. Hybrid being a combination of quantum and the more traditional computing that we have today. So we're gonna see improved classical quantum interfaces where we're developing seamless communication protocols between classical and quantum computers, which is crucial for efficient operation. We're seeing software innovation where new algorithms and programming languages specifically designed for hybrid systems will be key to unlocking the potential of quantum. And that will begin in 2024. The potential of hybrid quantum computing is undeniable. And 2024 could be a year where it takes significant strides towards realizing its full potential. We see a collaboration between classical and quantum and this involves classical pre-processing and post-processing steps to prepare and interpret quantum calculations. Maybe you want to call that optimization. I don't know. But quantum computing enters the picture in 2024. And I believe it's going to be a, a, a major game changer. Maybe not in 2024. But as we go forward, we're going to see a lot of things transition there. It's going to be a huge hunting ground for venture capital and in investments and new companies in let's say 25 and beyond. I'm also calling this shot 2024, the year of organizational change management. Yeah, nothing to do with technology necessarily, but understanding how your stakeholders internally are looking at problems. And so focus on the people aspect of that activity. We just threw artificial intelligence into the mix in our organizations. Most of us didn't do anything about taking care of the people and all their various perspectives on this thing. 
And uh, it, is, it, is, it is hurting morale, it is hurting productivity. And I think in 2024, we're gonna start accepting that OCM, Organizational Change Management, is a part of all these projects. Okay, my last trend for you. Data engineering will become the highest value prop uh, profession, highest value profession. Does anybody remember a few years ago, the data scientist was declared the world's sexiest job? Hmm. Yes, it was. And I think data engineering could be that in 2024. I don't know if I'll declare it as such or if one of you gets to declare it as such and what that means anyway. But with respect to the prompt engineer, uh, which is also hot, I think data engineering is becoming something that uh, the general market is is starting to see is uber important, like the most important job in all of this, the most important job in the company sometimes. BI analysts out there, you're going to have to up-level, use those code assists. Some, uh, st st still, there are some prefabricated reports that are created and presented by BI analysts. I'm not talking about that level of data engineering. I'm talking about architecture, talking about implementation, talking about supporting data science and that sort of thing. Now, some of you may have seen, uh, there's a commercial on it. Just I just saw it this morning, as a matter of fact. Matthew McConaughey, he was on this commercial. I think it was for Salesforce. And and he said, well, doesn't, if, if AI is the new frontier or something like that, doesn't that make data the new oil? I mean, this hit national television. So again, uh, this is just kind of a fun one. But I think that more value is going to come to data engineering because there's going to be more acknowledgement that, hey, that's a pretty important profession for us here in this company. Summary, simplified data architectures, regulation around privacy and AI, gen AI success, AI agents and companions, and other forms of AI change for a significant industry change. Healthcare and AI, I called them out. Uh, I said AI there, I should have said education, excuse me, healthcare education and others, calling it the year of observability. And finally, feel good if you're a data engineer or you're around a data engineer or you're somehow a data engineer because it just rocks. And that's going to be recognized in 2024, which brings me to the end of my trends. Shannon, I didn't leave a lot of time, but if there are any questions, I can take them now. Well, thank you so much for this. It's always interesting. I love the, especially when you first grade yourself um, uh, from last year. It's really uh, insightful. So I'm going to just dive in here. We've got a few minutes left. Um, how do you see city governments getting started with AI? I think um, smart cities is going to be a trend. And uh, I think that uh, uh, the, I think one way that they will start is the flow of traffic and the, the metering of the lights and also the flow of resources around within the, especially the downtown areas of cities, whether that be vendors, whether that be uh, rest areas or bathrooms or other forms of services that people generally need, I think that they're gonna be more optimized uh, based on AI. So um, the flow of traffic, uh, the uh, directional arrows, the speed limits, all this sort of thing can be turned over to AI and optimized uh, just to make our, our lives a little bit better. And I think that is going to be a direction for some progressive govern, government, city governments in the new year. Oh, I love that. Less traffic. <laughs> More efficiency. <laughs> yep. So, William, um, do you think there will be an increase in fraud relating to AI using deep fakes? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, this technology is not solely put in the hands of, uh, let's say, the white hats, right? Uh, plenty of black hats, which is why security is going to be at an all-time high in 2024. But yes, uh, we see it already. We see it already. We see mimicked voices of, let's say, a a a um, a, a, a college student, let's say. We, we see that their voices are now mimicked and, and they're calling the grandparents, hey, I'm in trouble. Can you send me some, some money, blah, blah, blah. And we're seeing all kinds of forms of that. I've even been called here uh, with, with what I knew was a fake. And I think that that's just going to be more and more. So, you know, we get these uh, 
we get these telemarketer calls all the time. <laughs> and I just think that that's going to kind of get, get even more worse and, and automated with AI. Sorry to say, but yes, fraud will fraud will definitely be a huge part of this and combating fraud will be another huge area that we'll have to focus on. So sad, but, but true. Um, well, I'm afraid that some great questions coming in here. Maybe I'll get these over to you, William, um, take a look at these. But I'm afraid that is all the time we have. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day uh, Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thanks, everyone. I hope you have a great day. And uh, I look forward to uh, how these trends, play, predicted trends play out. Me too. Thank you. Thanks, William. Thanks, y'all.